Curiously enough, um, I began to think about this next uh, small cluster of speakers when I came upon some references about the relative decline of men in social status and length of life, together with uh, some fairly persuasive speculation about the eventual decay of the Y chromosome. Since the default structure in humans is female, that suggests that eventually males will die out. And that wouldn't be the end of the world either because apparently we're on the cusp of a moment in history when women will be able to fertilize themselves. I'm not kidding. <laughs> So this got me thinking about females, of course, and their lives appear to me to be much more difficult than ours, and yet they live longer, appreciably longer. And that got me thinking about what it's like to be a woman, and particularly what it's like to be a woman in the year 2008. So um, in this session, we're going to begin with psychologist Susan Pinker, who asks this question. How is it that females excel early on, but then fade in the world of ambition, whereas with many a loser boy, <laughs> it seems to work out in the reverse? She turns upside down many important ideas and achievements which kind of shock people. Um, namely, the, the ideas that she turns upside down uh, uh, are that men and women are essentially biologically equivalent, that intelligence is all that you really need to succeed, and that men and women essentially want the same things out of life and work. Well, wasn't there a president of Harvard University, or should I say an ex-president of Harvard University who got into a lot of trouble for suggesting something roughly the same. So uh, the real puzzle for me, for me, is why is the old and obvious idea of sex differences so controversial? Where's Susan? There you are. Uh, thank you, Moses, for that generous introduction. Um, let's get it. Oh, is we going to start here? Um, the, the subtitle of my book, The Sexual Paradox, is um, Extreme Men. Well, let's see if we can get it on. Oops, it's not it. Extreme Men, Gifted Women, and the Real Gender Gap. And, and when I started to get involved with Idea City, I thought, hmm, extreme men. That reminds me of Moses Neimer. <laughs> Um, I, actually, I'd like to start off with a couple of questions for the audience that will give you a feeling for what I've been immersed in in the last uh, three years. A question first for the women. Um, imagine that little boy you sat beside in third grade, you know, the one who struggled to learn to read, who maybe had special education classes, who maybe copied your answers on your tests. And have you ever wondered why he's now running your pension fund and driving a Lexus? Okay. <laughs> That, that's one question, and now a question for the men. Um, you know, think about that very highly uh, gifted, high-achieving, well-organized, disciplined woman in your MBA or, or a law class. Um, have you ever wondered why she's now working, say, three or four days a week for a nonprofit foundation instead of running for office or running her own Fortune 500 company. Sometimes the outcome of sex differences is not exactly what we would expect. So I, I'd like to ask you to kind of consider with me some of these paradoxes. Um, where I started with this is because I'm, I'm a developmental psychologist, and what people don't know who don't work in the field is that you spend your life with troubled boys. Every day you open up your waiting room door, and there's a Justin, a Jared, an Andrew, a Michael, or whatever. And uh, <laughs> a, 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 every day, every day. Day. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to run through some of the statistics with you. Um, 
Attention deficit disorder is twice as common among boys as girls. Uh, conduct disorder, this is very serious behavior problems, you know, kids who are lighting things on fire, swearing at their teachers and so on. Three times as common among boys as girls. Language disorder is four times as common, um, and this includes dyslexia, naming problems, stuttering. Anybody met a stutterer? I'll bet my bottom dollar he was a boy. And uh, finally, Asperger's syndrome, which is a high-functioning form of autism, uh, which at, its, at that range uh, is 10 times as common among boys as girls. This is not something culture created, this is something that biology created, and if any of, us, any of you were in the audience for Steve Scherer's interesting presentation yesterday on the genome, um, he does research in the genome that maps out um, autistic spectrum disorders. Now, how I got started with this question um, was really that I start, after several decades of seeing boys, 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 and usually brought in to my office by very talented, gifted, highly educated mothers, I started to see some of these early, as uh, Moses called them, losers, featured as success stories in the press. So one had become a celebrity chef. He had dyslexia, I remember, and um, started to punch kids out in the schoolyard. That's one of the stories I tell in my book. Another one had become an inventor. Another was featured in the uh, financial pages of the Globe and Mail as an investment person. Um, a fourth one, this one was really shocking to me because this boy, you know, when I saw him at age seven, he, he was like lighting curtains on fire. And now he was featured first in my local paper as a, as a designer of some renown, and then on the Saturday, I saw him in the style section of the Globe and Mail, and then I opened my Sunday New York Times, and there he was again. And I thought, darn, I, I'm a good psychologist, but I'm not that good. <laughs> so so it, it made me wonder, is there some sort of flip side to this male biological fragility? Um, and, and of course, uh, you, know, you know, to bring Moses in again, you know, Talking about flip sides, his own history as a child of refugees, as a refugee himself and Holocaust survivor. And he used, when I talked to him yesterday, he used the phrase, the advantage of disadvantage, um, and which I think he thinks had a big role to play in his own success. But it, could a similar oxymoron be at work here um, with this genetic fragility, which carries on into w adult males? We all assume that males are the stronger sex. Right? This is our starting assumption. But let's look at the facts on the ground. Um, males have much more chronic disease. In fact, every single iconic, chronic disease, I may be wrong, but I think um, except arthritis is more common among men, heart disease, cancer, liver disease, AIDS, kidney disease. Um, men get it more often. And so that's um, evidence of a biological fragility right there. Prisoners. Um, you know, we're supposed to really want what men want as women, um, but do we really want to uh, be in prison? It's, uh, even if you want it, it's very highly unlikely because the ratio is 10 to 1. Nine times as many people killed at work are, are male. Suicides, depression, and anxiety is much more common among women, but who takes their own lives? It's men because they often take uh, risks, sometimes mortal risks. Accidents, twice as common among males as females, um, and it sort of hit home recently because um, my poor husband, who's in the audience, will cringe that we have an adolescent son who is a, a bike rider who was hit by a car not once but twice in the last nine months. And as my daughter said, you know, Carla, I, I've driven to McGill at least twice uh, every day for the last four years, and I, ne I was never hit by a car, like, once. Uh, and as Moses said, uh, the life expectancy of men in Canada is about five years less than it is for women. And all of this put together paints a, a pretty solid picture of fragility, biological fragility, which is one reason why there's an anthropologist at Yale who does um, biological anthropology, and he's, he summarized the lifespan of males over the last 2,500 years up to the present day in three words. Stud, dud, thud. <laughs> <laughs>
There's a, a place in Sarnia that's uh, called affectionately Chemical Valley because it is the most, one of the most polluted places on Earth. And um, that's, there are a lot of native communities that live in that area because it's, it's kind of downwind and downstream from a lot of petrochemical development and mining. And what's happening in Chemical Valley is that there's sex-based culling. The environmental pollutants, the, the stressors, are causing half of the male fetuses to be spontaneously aborted. So twice as many girls are being born there right now as, uh, uh, twice as boys because the boys are disappearing. kind of has a, a biblical feeling, but it's to give you the feeling that really males are more vulnerable biologically from not just birth, the moment of conception. Um, and, you know, we have a tremendous capacity now to keep tiny, tiny preemies alive. Almost twice as many of them are female. We lose, really, a lot of those boys. And the ones who do survive, a lot of them are the ones who end up in my office, actually, because they have long-standing disabilities. Let's look at some of the girls' strengths. Since Moses asked me to talk about women in 2008, I couldn't really talk about men the whole time. Um, they speak earlier, they talk faster, I better talk faster. They have a larger vocabulary. They, from the first moments of life, they have better social skills. They have better empathy. Um, right from the first days of life, for example, they make more eye contact with their parents than boys on average. I'm always, when I talk about sex differences, I'm always talking about statistical averages. So when you think, hey, that doesn't fit me or my Aunt Mindy, that, that makes sense, because you are, yeah, and Mindy are going into the statistical blender, and what you come out with is an average. Um, what's really interesting about little girls is even before they're verbal, they, uh, res they start to cry in the neonatal nursery when another infant cries more easily than boys do. When a another child is distressed, they show distress and try to relieve that distress very early on. And some of these early social and verbal skills mild to moderate though they may be, translate into stronger reading and spelling and writing in all of the developed countries. So all over the Western world, uh, girls are beating the pants off boys in the classroom and are neck and neck with boys in math. Certainly in language skills, they're far ahead. In math, they're pretty much even, except in Asia where they're also ahead. So um, why is the question. And just like we saw the testosterone Olympics influenced bohogs and influences neural development among males, oxytocin, which has been called the elixir of contentment, influences uh, women's behavior too. Um, and it's produced in greater amounts in women. It's a kind of a homegrown analgesic. Um, it surges at critical moments in women's lives during sex. That's why orgasm is fun. Uh, Labor, breastfeeding, cuddling, and interestingly, nurturing and reaching out to others gives women a shot of oxytocin, which is partially why they do it. Evolution is not a dummy, and they know that taking care of children who are smelly, demanding, and noising and never say thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if that was the way it was, we wouldn't have survived as a species, but oxytocin makes it feel good. What happens if you blast guys with oxytocin? What does it do? And there was an experiment where they took, it was a randomized controlled trial of two men where they had the experimental group squirt oxytocin up their noses through a distant, kind of a dist, uh, Dristan nasal spray, and the other group uh, sprayed a placebo, probably Dristan. And they found that the men who were in the oxytocin group were suddenly better able to identify emotions in other people's faces before uh, compared to the experimental groups. Just as a, a final comment, um, I don't think, is it really true that women are just like men, with, but, you know, with a few extra gadgets, widgets, hoojis? And I would say that the evidence that is emerging now from the new science tells us that, no, it's not true. And in fact, there's some really interesting advantages to being female that not very many people have paid attention to until now. When they're following large groups of people to see what happens to them over time, they find that the people who have the largest oops, social networks are the ones who live the longest. And I, I won't... Uh, you know, underestimate you to think who has, who spends their life building and grooming social networks. So that's part of the question that Moses posed at the beginning. Um, women, paradoxically, uh, when they're asked, are happier at work than men are. 
even though on average they earn less when we group all their occupations together. And I don't have time to tell you why that is, so I'll let you use your imagination or maybe read the book. Um, they have reduced cognitive c decline on average, and those who have elaborate social networks keep their marbles longer. Uh, so it's not just Sudoku puzzles, it's your friends, it's your family, and this isn't a waste of time. Um, so as I said at the beginning, there's less chronic disease, and women live longer. So I'd just like to stop here and, and thank you, and thank you, Moses. Fellas, it's not all bad news. <laughs> if you hit 85, apparently your statistical chances of getting to 100 are very good. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. But at 100, fellas, the girls outnumber the boys 9 to 1. <laughs> so even if you were that loser as an adolescent, you're finally going to get a date. <laughs>